Good evening, and welcome to an event that has been years in the making and which represents a monumental collaboration to advance the health of people everywhere. I'm thrilled to be speaking to you from the Hans Rosling Center for Population Health. I wish all of us could be in this inspiring space together. In a few moments, you'll get to learn more about this building and the life-changing work that will take place here. But first, I want to thank the many extraordinary people and teams who made it a reality. This collaborative effort represents the core principles of the University of Washington's Population Health Initiative. In particular, I want to thank Bill and Melinda Gates and the Gates Foundation. Their transformative gift in concert with public investment made this center possible. Bill and Melinda's investment may take the shape of this beautiful building, but their foresight and commitment encompasses so much more. They share the UW's vision to improve population health by addressing all the factors that determine how long and how well we live, and to create a future in which all communities have equitable access to health care, vibrant environments, social justice, economic opportunity, and more. As COVID has illustrated, we still have much work to do to achieve this vision. We're pursuing it within and across every discipline and with partners here in Washington and around the globe, from medicine to social work to policymaking and the arts to the health data science that the center's namesake, Hans Rosling, pioneered. All of these are vital to achieving our vision of a healthier, more equitable world. Thank you to all who have helped to make this day possible. And while COVID is keeping us at a distance, I know we're united in our commitment to achieving our vision. I'm so excited to hear Dr. Ali Mokdad's lecture on the meaning of population health. If you've heard Ali speak before, you know that you'll come away with some very, very important lessons. And so I now invite you to enjoy a brief video introduction to the Hans Rosling Center for Population Health at the University of Washington. Our health, the health of our communities, and the health of people around the world is all connected. At the University of Washington, we're addressing the intersecting factors that affect how long and how well we live. In 2016, the UW launched the Population Health Initiative. From human health and environmental resilience to social and economic equity, we're leading the way in turning research into real action. Action that saves lives. Bill and Melinda Gates share our belief in the importance of working across disciplines. That's why they made a visionary gift with support from the people of Washington to help create the Hans Rosling Center for Population Health. Well, my family has a great history of working with the university. And so naturally, as the foundation was growing here in this community, we turned to the University of Washington to learn together. And it's been phenomenal uh, to have uh, Seattle and the UW in particular uh, leading with these capacities uh, that's made such a difference globally. I think this center is going to be a place where there will be discovery, uh, where people will figure out new social ways of delivering global health. I think it's a place where data will come together and inform decisions and great intellectual conversations will happen and debate back and forth. I think now more than ever, universities have this really critical role in in our world, in our planet, in generating research and knowledge that uh, people can trust, can rely on, that they feel good about, that can then help inform some pretty important decisions that need to be made on our planet right now. And so universities are one of those places where people come together to try to do good um, based on facts, figures, and information. Hans Rosling was a Swedish physician and statistician with decades of public health experience. With his boundless enthusiasm and a flair for showmanship, Rosling made it his life's work to show us the difference between the way we imagined the world 
and the way it really is. Holmes became world famous for the data stories that he told that helped people understand the reality behind the data. He developed those stories together with me and my wife Anna during 20 years to help people understand the world. He was a unbelievably gifted speaker and he made it really accessible to everybody. He got people laughing, he entertained, but it was a serious cause because he believed in saving lives. And I know so many friends who don't have anything to do with global health or public health, and they still remember his presentations and the main point of his presentations. And that's how you know Hans was a really good teacher. And he really changed how I and many others are able to explain the progress we've made and yet explain what we're not getting done yet. Uh, this is why he called himself a possibilist uh, so that he could carry the good news of the progress with the need to make even more progress. The Rosling Center provides a collaborative home to the Institute of Health Metrics and Evaluation, units of the School of Public Health, the Department of Global Health, and the offices of the Population Health Initiative. The Hans Rosling Center for Population Health marks the beginning of a new era of possibility, addressing some of the most crucial issues of our time poverty, equity, healthcare access, climate change, and more. My hope is that po the Population Health Initiative and this building, that it really fulfill its beacon function of summoning the best and the brightest who want to make a difference in this world. Hans affected uh, me and our global health work because he constantly reminded me to not forget about people on the margins. I think this center, this place of learning can embody that for the world. And we need to remember Hans's inspiration. That is what everybody is working on in this building, is improving the world for good. And that means taking public health to the far reaches of the world, not just the Pacific Northwest. On behalf of all our family, a big thank you to all future students, teachers and researchers, and to Melinda and Bill Gates and the University of Washington for this wonderful building. Good evening. Thank you, President Kausi, for the introduction. It's an honor to be with you tonight on this occasion. And like you, I wish it was under different circumstances where we could be gathered in person. I'm speaking to you tonight from the beautiful New Hans Roslin Center for Population Health on the campus of the University of Washington. I want to thank Bill and Melinda Gates the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and the people of the state of Washington for the generous funding for this building. Thank you as well for the family of Hans Roslin. Your husband and father served as an inspiration for so many of us in the field of population health. This extraordinary facility honors his and his lifelong commitment to health. And the impact he has made and he continues to make on countless lives around the world. This is my mother and two sisters who live in Beirut, Lebanon. My mom had heart bypass surgery 10 years ago. She has a weak heart. And we make sure, the three of us, that she sees her cardiologist and her family physician once every three months. 
The best scenario for her is to spend half an hour with each one. So about four hours a year. And there are 8,760 hours in a year. This is about 0.045% of her entire year. At the hours she spends sleeping, call it eight hours of sleep a night, and the time spent with her medical team is still just four out of 5,840 hours, or about 0.068% of her time. The rest of her time she spends in her community, meeting friends, shopping, cooking for her family. Whether in Beirut or here in Seattle or thousand communities between them, every one of us is looking for a healthy and prosperous future. Dr. David Erickson said health happens in neighborhoods. I couldn't agree more. And that's why I'm so proud of the approach of the University of Washington is taking to improve population health. Population health is a broad concept that encompasses not only the elimination of diseases, disabilities, and injuries, but also the intersection and overlap of issues and conditions that influence health and well-being. These issues collectively revolve around the three pillars of human health, environmental resiliency and social and economic equity. Population health requires a multidisciplinary approach to realize impact on both the individual and collective level. There is no magic bullet or quick solution to address the major challenges facing the health and well-being of communities. Here in Puget Sound region and around the world. To that end, true improvements in population health require bringing everyone to the table. Only by working together can we implement sustainable and impactful solutions? So who needs a seat at that table? You need physicians and nurses, public health professionals, urban planners, engineers, lawyers, social workers, business and policy makers, to name a few. Everyone has a role to play in, this sol in the solutions to the seemingly interactable challenges we face. But the most important voice in this discussion is the community. Community participation is key to adopting innovative approaches and for change, lasting and impactful change to happen. This is what population health is. It's about the human capital, investing in people, in their education, and in their health to advance our economy, allowing all of us to benefit and leaving no one behind. We also need to understand the drivers of why certain communities do better against all odds and how we all can learn from these ongoing experiments to build a better future. We say some communities and some groups are resilient. As good as resilience may be, communities are tired of it. Resilience should not replace the responsibility of leadership. Communities should not be left alone to deal with their challenges. Sadly, the COVID-19 pandemic has vividly illustrated for all of us the importance of population health and how the University of Washington's vision is the right one. It is a vision that is just, a vision that is inclusive, a vision I believe all of us can and must embrace. People of color are disproportionately suffering from COVID-19. They make a large number of the essential workers who work diligently to keep food on our tables and in many ways are keeping our country running during this difficult time. Their work requires them to be out and about. They are more likely to get infected with the coronavirus because of the heightened risk of exposure, most likely to be exposed to pollution that increases the risk of poor outcomes from COVID, more likely to live with extended families in close quarters, making social distancing difficult, 
more likely to delay seeking care, more likely to die due to pre-existing health conditions. Moreover, for many people of color, if they want to be physically active and eat a proper balanced diet, they may not be able to do so because of several factors. Easier access to convenience stores rather than grocery stores, insufficient access to public transportation and time. It is 7 p.m. The children are hungry, and the burgers and fries at the fast food restaurant are easier and cheaper to access than fresh fruits and vegetables at the grocery stores several miles away. These are the inequities that our president, Anna Mari Kausi, may well have been pondering when in May 2016, she first challenged the UW community to make and even a greater impact on people's life and livelihoods. She called on all of us to work together in more integrated and collaborative way to innovate in our teaching, our research, and community service. She has energized and inspired, inspired our community with this, with this charge and has helped all of us to see how collectively we can accelerate change. And I am proud to have the privilege of being part of this initiative. In a short time, we have inspired the university and many of its schools and departments, students and faculty and staff engaging broadly across disciplines in ways and at a scale not previously seen. We have funded more than 80 pilot research projects, allowing interdisciplinary teams of faculty, students, and staff and outside partners to test innovative new ideas for improving population health. In one pilot, just to give you an example, in one pilot, a team from our schools of public health, medicine, and social work assessed whether health care providers were asking patients at risk for suicide if they had asked if they have access to firearms or medication and then working with the patients and their families to limit that access until the risk of suicide decreased. Their study findings were used to inform clinical practice in the emergency room here at Harbor View Medical Center. And their data has also proved to be imperative for a larger project funded by the United States Center for Disease Control and Prevention. And just in the last few months, we have funded pilots project looking at ways to rapidly respond to COVID-19 pandemic, support economic recovery in our local communities, and promote more equitable population health outcomes in communities of color. We have added education and training for our students to highlight the role their prospective disciplines can play in improving population health. We have accomplished this through courses, enrolling more than 3,000 undergraduate students a year, and offering fellowships and certificate programs focused on developing critical skills needed for the next generation of population health leaders. The next generation of leader could be one of our arts of science freshmen. Yes, we want at UW to have the best English major graduate, best engineer, best computer scientist to graduate from UW, but we also want them to know that they have a role to play in the population health. We have also taken steps to make it easier for the university to partner with new collaboration, collaborators, whether other university, foundations, or government agencies. And of course, I come back to our new Hans Rollins Center for Population Health. It will house the Department of Global Health, the Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation, IHME, parts of the School of Public Health, and of course, the Population Health Initiative. It will be the population health hub for the university where we bring all of our different disciplines together in one place to roll up our sleeves and to ask the tough questions and find the solutions needed to make lasting improvements in population health and well-being. Population health is even more a priority today. We have a worldwide pandemic. Trust in science is low. Scientists are too often criticized for their work. Vaccines are being questioned. 
we need a voice of reason. Through our work, the UW, University of Washington, will be the place where science drives policies, where facts are the basis of sound decisions, where everyone, mothers, scientists, journalists, and others, can turn for the most certainty that science can offer. Through our collective work, we can be the lighthouse in this dark time. I want to end up on a personal note. My mom would have benefited from prevention messages, as would her community. As a child, I didn't know much about the harm of smoking and other risk factors. Both my parents smoked and suffered from ill health. Every one of us likely has a similar story to tell. As I noted at the outset, we are looking for a healthy and prosperous future. Please join us in creating a world where all people can live healthier and more fulfilling lives. We cannot realize this broad vision alone. Our goal is collective. And if we work together, the future is brighter for all of us. Together we can and we will. Thank you. And now I'll take questions. The first question, if you have a magic wand that will, uh, would allow you to do one thing to improve population health right now, what would you do? That's a very good question and a difficult one to answer. I would do a lot of things, but I will start globally with education, women education. Uh, if we have equity in education, and more educated women are more likely to understand the sign of danger for her and her family, more likely to seek medical care, more likely to adhere to a medical message, more likely to be in control of her economics. For the United States, universal health coverage. Thank you for the question. What can I, as an individual, do to improve population health? All of us have a role to play here. We can be a role model if we are a mom or a father. I can do my part if I am an engineer. I can do my part if I am a teacher in a school. All of us have a role to play. We are much stronger if we work together on a common cause. What are your thoughts on a future pandemic? We have to be ready for a pandemic. Uh, COVID-19 taught us a difficult lesson. We should have been better prepared for it, and we should not allow this to happen again. Preparedness is very important for all of us, governments, families, communities. We need to provide them with the resources they need to be prepared for a pandemic. How many other people academically are working on population health? <laughs> you have to know our president to get that answer correctly. She energized all of us. All of us are working on this. Uh, most of the requests I get right now in this role is why I'm not on the table during your meetings. So all of us at the university, all our students, all our staff, 95,000 strong, working on population health, but also seeking the right partners, working with our own community as well. What do you think the biggest challenges are around getting everyone healthy? Several factors. That's why we focus on three pillars in, uh, in, global, in our population health. One is health, of course. You need to make sure people have access to quality medical care, uh, health insurance, universal health coverage, as I mentioned. Environmental resiliency, you have to make sure that the planet will sustain life, we have enough water for everybody else, we don't have many pollutants, but also environment means that if I want to be physically active in my neighborhood, I can safely do so. I don't mean in terms of crime, I mean I have a sidewalk, I have a park I, I, go, I can go to. But also, very important, social and economic equity. How could you ask a mom to be healthy where she's struggling to feed her children, where she has to decide between her own health or braces to her child? So we have to look at the whole thing together and work all of us together in order to achieve 
a healthy life for all of us. We all deserve to live longer and healthier, of course. What are you most excited about the Hans Roseland Center? Unfortunately, we can't show you the building, but this is a hub for all of us to get together. We were in different places. And also, if you know the campus of the university, it's in a central location between what we call upper, upper and lower campus. So it is bringing everybody together in a central location. We'll have space to meet. We'll have pay, space to host people, classrooms that we can teach everybody here. But also, there'll be quality research and innovative research going on here in order to improve population health. Asking the right questions, finding out why we have a problem, how we could maximize our output giving our input, how we could best allocate our resources right now, and of course, how we could hear the communities and listen to them and involve them in the solution. Is there value in the United States to consider implementing the community health worker model found in most developing countries to strengthen our frontline health system? Yes, definitely yes. That's a very good question. I work in many countries. I do global health, of course. And in any country you go, you meet a local health worker or health promoter, and they work with the community. They're locally. They're hired from the community themselves. The community trusts them. They're a liaison between the health authority and the community. They know the problems. They know what the issues. And yes, we need such service here in the United States. It will improve health at the community level, especially in rural area, of course. Population health seems like an obvious area of research. Why has it taken us so long to get this initiative? A very good question. We all ask ourselves the same question. But I want first to pause here and say this university, my university, has been doing very innovative work ahead of this population health initiative. We have an active school of medicine, school of public health, art and sciences. I can give you examples and examples. It's the right time for us to move into population health with what we see around us. And our president had the vision and called upon all of us to do it. So it's a little bit late in my opinion, but we have a wonderful president here who has a great idea and has energized all of us to do it. And resources are being put into this in order to make sure we can do work and not only talk about it. Do you think that we ever be t a time when we don't need a population health initiative? I hope so. I'm very optimistic. But I don't see it immediately. Uh, I hope that we reach a time where everybody has an equal access to health care, an, e an equal access to safe water and safe environment, equally have jobs and opportunity, education and everything. Unfortunately, in many countries in the world, we're not there yet. Population health is the right strategy to move forward. And I hope, I'm very optimistic, I hope we achieve that. And I hope at one point of time, everything is going in the right direction, that we keep doing our teaching and our science and our research. But an initiative like this, we look at it and say, you know, why didn't we do it earlier? And look how much difference it has made for everybody in the world. I'm very optimistic. I wish, I have a daughter who's 20 years old. I wish one day I can take my grandchildren to a museum and we sh display poverty. And my grandchildren will say, Grandpa, how cruel were you to allow this to happen when you were growing up and when you were living? So I'm very optimistic. How did you get interested in population health? I started in uh, public health. My undergraduate is from a faculty of health sciences school of public health. Uh, I grew up in a poor neighborhood. I mentioned my family. I grew up in a poor farming uh, village in Lebanon, Mount Lebanon. Road came to my village when I was seven or eight years old. Electricity came after. Running water came to my village when, when I was already in college. I was the first in my family to graduate with a high school and first to go to college. So I've experienced all these issues that we're talking about firsthand. And I know right now that that's the right path in order to improve the health of my family in my own village. 
we need a population health like this initiative and activities like this to improve the health. Will the UW offer a measure in population health? We have great measures in public health, and then we have, we're adding more courses on population health. But right now, I don't see it coming immediately. I leave it up to our dean of school of public health to decide how she will handle that. But yes, the university is focusing on population health. Can you describe what you want universal health care to look like in the U.S., similar to universal Medicare or Medicaid, something else entirely? Very good question. Uh, you know, in this country, I've been in this country since I was 24 years old. We talk more about health than anybody else. We debated more than anybody else. We spend on health more than anybody else. We almost spend half of what the world spend on health in, the, this, in this country. And our outcomes, when you look at them, when you look at any metric, we don't do very well. Compared to our competitors, even to other countries, our life expectancy, for example, is 39 uh, in the world. So when the question is, why are we spending so much on health? As a rich country, it's okay to spend more money on health. It's okay. If you are a rich person, it's okay to spend more money on your house or on your car. But the question is, what, are you getting the good return on your investment? If somebody is getting the same return and spending less on health, that's the debate. So when you look at what's happening in the United States, many people cannot access a physician. Many people have to go to an emergency room when they have a problem. We don't have a safety network for people to go to a physician like I have with my health insurance. Many people don't even have access. I'm lucky to live here in the city where we have a good medical school and a good hospital. If something happens to me, within minutes, I am in the, one of the best medical centers of the world. But not everybody in this country have that access. So how can we do this? Universal health coverage. Make medi medicine, meet, go to a doctor, make it free for everybody else. And then we could figure it out. We are paying for everybody who's 65 and older in this country, but we're not paying for them when they are below 65. We're not preventing many of the diseases, and we're delaying the spending, and we're causing more problems at 65 and older. So yes, universal health coverage will be like what other countries in the world have. It will not lower our quality of medicine. People could still have the option to buy insurance or go to a private physician, but at least, Everybody has an equal access to medical care for the basic care that we need. That's the first step. <coughs> On a global level, what do you think the biggest cultural obstacle will be with trying to improve public health? Earlier you mentioned that one way to improve will be education of women. Do you think this might be an issue in some countries where women are not encouraged to be educated? Yes, yes, this is the biggest problem. So I have, I work in the Middle East. I'm originally from Lebanon, I said that. And in many countries in the Middle East, uh, girls don't have the same access as boys to go to schools. And I'll be quite honest here, I'm frustrated with it, but I'll be even more honest, trying to be politically correct. Many people in the Middle East, where I come from, wouldn't allow their wife or their daughter to see a male physician, but at the same time, they don't allow their girls to go to school. Go figure it out. Yes, we need education for women. Yes, we need to make sure that our girls get the same education that our boys get. And yes, this will improve health tremendously. You cannot keep half of the population not educated and expect to improve your health and your education and you expect to improve your economy. So education, especially women education and equity, for women and women health is very important. If you were asked by the President of the United States to make three significant changes to improve health outcome while lowering health cost, what would those three changes be? It's a very difficult question, but if I'm understanding this question correctly, you're talking about in health what I do in terms of health. I mentioned universal health coverage, it's very important. Socioeconomic factors. In this country, we have a disparity in health. When you look at my city where I live, there are between census tract about 18 years difference in life expectancy between one census tract and another in Seattle, in King County where I live. 
This is not acceptable in the United States. 80% of our counties have life expectancy lower than that of other countries. I don't need to name other countries. We, we can do better. So universal health coverage for everybody to have access to health care and quality of health care, that's very important. Addressing the social and economic factors, employment and education. We have a lot of disparity on education here in this country and we have to address it. That's very important. Environment, of course. Third one, I will tackle some of the environmental issues that are causing a lot of problems in the United States. Pollution is the first one that I will attack, of course. What is the role policy maker, especially physician policy maker, play in Physicians have a big role to play in population health. We have to involve physician in prevention. So right now, a patient, my mom, is more like, I gave an example of my mom. My mom is more likely to listen to her physician, to the white robe that she's talking to, when he tells her or she tells her to do something. So involving physicians in our prevention, that's very important. Involving physicians in our population health is very important. So one thing that we can do in this country, expand the mandate of a hospital, not only to take care of patients, but also to take care in preventive way of the population where they are. And that's very important. Physicians have nurses, social workers, everybody has a big role to play in this. What do you foresee the new acceptance of telemedicine and telehealth care due to COVID-19 pandemic influence access to health care? There's positive in it, so, but again, in this country, we know about 15% of the houses don't have access to fast internet. There are rural area. So we have to address these issues, uh, social economic equity, of course, and make sure everybody has access to internet so they can do this. And also at the same time, we have to place some of the testing capacity to be available for everybody. So where could we put a scan, for example, an MRI, in order for people can access it easily instead of driving a long time. If now we are gonna change our behavior and move from big cities to a rural area. If I only take one key thing away from the concept of population health, what should it be? Collaboration, collaboration, collaboration. Thank you very much, thank you.